let's talk about the divorce decree template. So this template is to help remind you or your staff, whoever's drafting the divorce decree, of things you'll want to include in any divorce decree, or you'll at least want to consider if you want to include them or not. So we have a client information form, and basically it's the form we give the client at the beginning with all their data. So name, address, social security number, driver's license number, children's names, ages, all of that. And so you want to definitely, assuming you have a similar form, check that and make sure we're spelling everybody's names right, that we have all the data points correct. And it's very embarrassing, of course, to send a pleading to a client where you've misspelled their child's middle name. <laughs> so this is a good practice. And one thing to note that we note here in the template for you is if you don't look at the client's form, so the client's form is the one they filled out by hand or by typing themselves. If you rely on a prior pleading, you could be carrying forward someone else's mistake. So if it's the client's mistake because they filled out the form, they're not going to be upset with you. But if it's another lawyer's mistake, you don't want to really carry that forward. So the best practice is to look at the form the client actually filled out. And things you'll need, so you'll see this category is prepare to draft by gathering necessary documents. So it's going to be that client information so you can check, make sure you're spelling everything right. The other item you'll need, of course, is a settlement document if there is one. So this could be your mediated settlement agreement, it could be your Rule 11 agreement, it could be in a collaborative case, minutes, spreadsheets, things of that nature. So you want to gather all those to get ready for drafting. And then in a litigation case, you'll have inventory and appraisement probably. And that's going to have a lot of the details you'll need for the decree. So that will be part of your gathering. And the spreadsheet. So you may have a spreadsheet you've created or in a collaborative case that the neutral financial has created. And that's going to be key to your drafting. If you have real estate, which most cases do, you'll need the deed of tr trust on the real estate so you'll have the legal description. And it's really the best practice to include the legal description and not just the street address. And then if you are in a collaborative setting, you'll want the parenting plan. So typically, the neutral mental health professional will have prepared a parenting plan that details all the rights and duties, all the schedules for holidays, summer, the normal schedule, and you'll want all that for your drafting. And you'll want the petition for divorce because it may have information in it um, that you need. And one thing to note and to look at is if the woman, typically the woman, I guess it could be the man, but if the woman wants to change her name, she must plead for it. And we've had judges who do not allow the name change if it has not been pled for. So it's not a crisis at this point. You can catch that. If they haven't pled for it, you'll just amend your pleading and make that request. But this is a good reminder to check that um, before you draft. And if it is already in there, then you'll have the name that she wants, assuming that it was specifically pled in the original pleading, um, to include the name change in your decree of divorce. Okay, drafting, next category is drafting of award of assets and debts. Now keep in mind um, that there's two ways we're awarding property. We're awarding community property, but we're also confirming separate property. And it's important to distinguish between the two. So we have a reminder here that you're going to put separate property in a different section than the Division of Community Assets and Debts. So we have our typical husband's awarded this, wife's awarded that, which is our Division of Assets that are community, but you're going to have a separate section that says we're confirming, it's different than awarding, we're confirming the husband's separate or the wife's separate, and you'll list that separately. So another tip is you may want to consider an oilty lien. And an oilty lien would be appropriate if, for example, one party is buying the other one out of the house, perhaps with a refinance. So in certain cases, you may need an oilty lien to secure that payment. And that wouldn't be in every case, but you'll want to consider as you're drafting, do you need an oilty lien? If you have a party that's being awarded a business, you want to award them not only the business, but all the debts and liabilities associated with the business. So don't forget that, and there's some nice standard wording out there that awards the liabilities of the business, also all the furniture and equipment that the business owns. 
I prefer specific versus general language, and I'll tell you what I mean. When you're awarding, let's just as an example, say money, cash in an account, bank accounts. Sometimes people will draft using broad language, what they'll say, husband is awarded all bank accounts in his name, including, and then they'll list the ones that they know about. I prefer husband is awarded the following accounts. And the reason that I prefer that is I don't want to award, assuming I represent the wife in this example, I don't want to award the husband hidden accounts that I didn't know about, that we didn't consider and negotiate for. So when I use that broad language, I might accidentally be doing that. I only want to award both of them the specific assets that I'm clear about and that we negotiated to divide. And post-divorce, if you've been specific only and you've said, okay, you get exactly this and you get exactly that, you can go back and claim that if you discovered the hidden account, you could go back and say, look, that was an undivided asset. And the code allows for that. You can go back after the divorce and divide it. But if you've used broad language, the argu argument could be made that it was awarded, even though you didn't really intend it. So that's boilerplate language that's in a lot of orders and in a lot of document preparation software. So be aware that generally, there might be some exception, but generally specific is better than general, in my opinion. And then we talked about, in, with real estate, you want to use the legal description so that you're properly identifying it. Okay, things to include. So if a woman wants a name change, remember to do that. We talked about that. If it's agreed, you want signature lines for the lawyers and for the parties. So we have reminders of that. You need to determine if it's a case that involves child support, if you are suspending the withholding or not. And what I mean by that is you're always going to have a wage withholding order because the courts require it. But you might suspend it, meaning as long as the payor pays timely and they're never more than 30 days late, we won't issue that wage withholding order. So they can just pay directly and they don't pay it directly to the other person. It has to go through San Antonio, through the state. But they don't have to have it wage withheld by their employer if we all agreed to suspend. So you need to make that decision or have that understanding. Whoever's drafting needs to know that answer if they're suspending the wage withholding or not. It's also best to have in the decree a specific list of documents that need to be signed to effectuate the decree and a specific date in the future that they will be signed by. Now, best, best practice is to have them all signed before we even enter the decree. And the type of documents I'm talking about are real estate documents like a special warranty deed or a deed of trust to secure assumption. It could be titles on the cars that we're signing over. It could be security documents if we're securing a payment over time. It could be a promissory note, a lien, things of that nature. So there are ancillary documents that we're going to need to sign to effectuate the deal that's struck and that's in the decree. And the best practice is even if you plan to do the best, best practice, double best, even if you plan to do that and you expect to have them signed before the decree is entered, just in case that doesn't happen, I would list out everything that each person is to sign and a date by which they are to show up at the other party's lawyer's office and sign them. And then, if they're signed in advance, fine. They don't have to show up on that day. But if they don't sign them in advance, and somehow that decree's entered and they never got signed, you're going to have a specific date. Then if they don't show up on that date, you could file a motion to enforce because you have a date that they were supposed to show up and they didn't and sign it. If you don't have that, if you don't have the specific date and the specific documents, it might be hard to make them do it post-divorce. Okay, if it is agreed, and this sounds like an unimportant small matter, and it is a small matter, but if it is agreed, title it agreed. Don't just title it final decree of divorce. Title it as agreed because in the future, if it's ever enforced or modified, courts like to know if it was agreed, and that's a quick way to know, and they don't have to dig through the whole thing and figure out or ask if it was agreed or if it was court ordered. So agreed obviously means that a judge did not have a trial and make this decision that the parties made the decision together and signed it. 
and in that case, title it Agreed. Okay, we use ProDoc, which is a great starting point to draft documents, and there's other great similar products out there, and I recommend using them, but I would use them as a starting point, and then you need to modify your pleadings and your orders and uh, to the specifics of your case. But I do list in this template things to be aware of. I call them glitches. I don't know if it's really a glitch. ProDoc probably doesn't think it's a glitch, but just things that I would do differently if I were creating ProDoc and to be aware of so you can alter your pleading if you prefer to. So the first one is I prefer that we combine the rights and duties so they don't unnecessarily repeat. Our decrees are so long as it is and you'll notice that the way ProDoc does the rights and duties it lists every category of right and duty separately for the husband and separately for the wife even if they're the same. So where they're the same combine those. So it doesn't take long to do that. It's mainly just deleting and adding a name. So I think that's a good tip to just make your decree a little bit less cumbersome. And sometimes the parties are going back in the future and re referring to those rights and duties and they may even be showing third parties. They may be showing a counselor or a school or a doctor, look I have this right. And it could be misleading if they're separate and it's exactly the same. So I also think just for use in the future and to not have third parties any more confused than they already are, it helps to combine those. Check to make sure that the extended summer doesn't repeat the possession time, begins and ends at 6 o'clock. For some reason it says it twice in there. So just double check that and you don't need to repeat it. Make sure, and this does not come out normally. You have to specifically request it. So I think it is an option in ProDoc, but it doesn't generate it automatically. But you want to include language, assuming it's agreed that this is a contract. Because there may be instances where you want to have the remedy of a breach of contract and not just a motion to enforce. So you definitely want the language, the paragraph that says this agreement is also a contract and that's just going to help you in the future. You know, we hope we never need to enforce any of this, but if we did, we might want to have a breach of contract option. Okay, again we talked about don't use broad, use specific. And this sounds funny, but I refer to number my paragraphs and to bold my headings. One, I think it looks better, but it's not just about aesthetics. When you're talking about this order in the future, so let's say you're doing a motion to modify or you're doing a motion to enforce and you're before the court, it is a lot easier for everybody if we can say, look at paragraph four. Then look at page four, the middle paragraph. Oh no, it's the third paragraph down. So if you number your paragraph, it's, it just is more useful when you're referring to that order in the future, if you need to refer to that order in the future. Okay, so for us, our firm is Duffy and Eitzen, and the way we write Duffy and Eitzen is Duffy plus Eitzen and not Duffy and Eitzen. So make sure your firm name is correct on your own document. <laughs> so that's our reminder. And then when you have signature lines, so this is again when you have an agreement, when you have signature lines, don't just put petitioner, put the person's name. Sometimes we can accidentally, throughout the document in fact, this is a good tip, put petitioner when we mean respondent because it doesn't catch our eye. Petitioner respondent, they're so commonly used in our business. But if you have their name, you or your client's going to catch that error. So it's a better practice anyway to every time you use the word petitioner respondent to also put their name or to only put their name. So keep that in mind. Okay, so when you're drafting the child provisions, assuming it's a case that involves children, one thing to think about is if you're going to use a parent facilitator, which is a great thing to use in many cases, it helps a lot of people. The parent facilitator language, there is some language in the code that you can model your parent facilitator language after. You definitely want to have more than a sentence. I usually have two pages on parent facilitator language. But sometimes people will just say, Joe Blow is appointed as our parent facilitator. And the parent facilitator themselves, they need more direction than that on what their powers and duties are, and what their rights are, how they're going to get paid. So the best practice is, one, to have some pretty good lengthy parent facilitator language, 
and then to send it to the parent facilitator before you enter this with the court. Because they may say, oh no, take out the third paragraph or add this or why doesn't say this. And since they're the ones that are going to be ordered to do something in that provision, it would be helpful that they look at that language and approve it. If you have a therapist or someone who is going to monitor these people for some reason, sometimes we'll have a monitor because somebody has had an alcohol and drug problem or maybe they've had a mental health problem. So you're going to have a monitor in the future or a therapist ordered to see the kids. Again, send that language to the therapist or the monitor in advance because they may tell you, I can't even do that. What you all are trying to order me to do, I can't even do. So you'd want to know that before you end up with an order signed by the judge that now you have to modify or undo. So keep that in mind. Possession schedule language. Obviously, you're going to have a possession schedule. And one thing to think about is it needs to be very specific so that it can be enforced in the future. And this, you know, with collaborative, which I love, we get very creative and that sometimes becomes less enforceable. So if you're going to have less enforceable language, it should only be on purpose. And you've already told your client, look, we can put this in there, but you're never going to be able to enforce it. But if you think you're not doing that, you want to have enforceable language, you need it to be very clear. So as an example, if a third party is reading this, the third party likely to be the judge in the future, and they're trying to figure out, okay, where was this kid supposed to be during the time that we're all arguing about? You need the third party to be crystal clear. And as an example, if it said, um, mom gets the child at six, dad to return the child to mom at six, and that's all it says. That's not adequate. Where? At mom's residence? Is mom picking up at the daycare? So it has to be specific as to place, person, time, and a third party should be able to read this and know exactly where someone should have been at a certain time to get that child. So you want to be real clear about that. And if you're not, because sometimes we're just too involved in the case ourselves, we've read this 15 times, it's good practice to have a third party read it who's not involved in that case and tell you that yes, I'm crystal clear about when that child is supposed to be with who for the whole year, so every holiday, so on and so forth. And sometimes that language is quickly overlooked, but there are areas of the year and the calendar, especially if the parties do anything creative on the holidays, that could overlap. An example is a non-standard holiday would be Easter, but these people love Easter and so they want to have an order about what's going to happen at Easter. And every other year this child is going to be swapped for Easter. Well, guess what? We all know Easter moves, right? Easter moves on the calendar. And sometimes spring break and Easter overlap, but nobody thought about that. So now we have conflicting language because dad's supposed to have spring break, but mom's supposed to have Easter. So think about holidays that could overlap. Another prime example is if you include Jewish holidays. If you have a family where Jewish holidays are celebrated, the Jewish holidays, and the, but then you also put in the standard holidays. So you have Christmas, but maybe you're calling it winter break because of the Jewish holidays. Well, Hanukkah can conflict with Christmas. Hanukkah in some years conflicts with Thanksgiving. So it's not obvious all the time. Hanukkah moves a lot. So some of these holidays that are not set on a specific date can conflict with the ones that do. And you just need to have language in there. And it's easy with the Jewish holidays. You can just say Jewish holidays always trump standard holidays. Done. You've solved your problem. With spring break and Easter, you can just say Easter always trumps. So anything that moves that doesn't have a set date you'd want to be thoughtful about what trumps if we're going to have a conflict there. And those are some things to think about when you're drafting your decree. And as you, you'll think of other things that we haven't thought of, you can add them to your template. So your divorce decree template, every time you come up with something of, oh, I wish we had thought of that, you can add it so the next time you will.